Hello and welcome to my show where I'm today talking to Anthony Blake whom I met through studying Gurdjieff. We both have a liking for Jilj Ivanovich Gurdjieff and <laughs> we've been reading his books for many years but uh, Tony's been in this work for how many years Tony? Oh God is uh, about 55 I suppose. So you're well I mean, studied. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you can define it by saying, what's the entry, you know, what's the mark <laughs> of joining up, where's my joining up card, you know, well, I sort of got involved about 35 years ago. And how was that then? How did you hear about Gurdjieff? Well, it, in my background, I was uh, at school and with various friends in the sixth form, and some of us had a sort of existentialist orientation, and we were very philosophical. Uh, and I became, uh, well, one time when I was about 16, you know, quite suicidal about the meaninglessness of everything, and did an equivalent to Pascal's wager, you know, either there is meaning, then it's pointless to kill yourself, or if there's not meaning, your choice to kill yourself or not has no meaning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I might as well assume there is meaning and, and see if I can connect with it. See, that was a real, it sounds just like a little rabbiting going on in the head, but it made a big difference to me, honestly. But then at school, we got, um, you know, into, well, eventually we came into Camus and Sartre and, and all that existentialism, the meaninglessness of everything. And I came across what was then a very popular book, probably people today have largely forgotten it, and that was Colin Wilson's The Outsider. One of my favourite books. Oh, the Yes, you know. when I read that, I felt like, finally, I found someone that understands. <laughs> oh, gosh, but how old were you then? Only about five years ago. Well, so, so I okay. came to Colin Wilson quite late. So in yeah. my late, late 30s. Gosh. Well, it's hit me like a bomb, and of course, uh, I was fascinated by all these descriptions of the poets, Hart Crane, Rambo, and the philosophers, Wittgenstein, and all the rest. But then comes on the Goethe from Spencer, he says, they were different, they knew something the other guys didn't know. So I got attracted to that idea. And, uh, so that would have made you look into him a bit more? Yeah, and it was, this is all so ordinary, so banal, going to the library, <laughs> eventually finding Gurdjieff and then finding Mr. Bennett and finding Bonnie one of his dramatic universe and wondering about it all, then eventually coming across his book on Subud. Do you know anything about Subud? I do, yes. Okay. But if you want to explain uh, for the well, radio show? His book was concerning Subud and it was about his encounter with this method or practice from Indonesia, initiating with a chap called Pak Subud which involved um, an act of submission and spontaneous manifestation, uh, which made a very big impact on some people and was quite uh, newsworthy at the time. And now again, it's one of those things forgotten. Hello, we're back after that quick phone call. <laughs> and Tony was just telling us about a suburb. Yeah. And you first read a book by J.G. Bennett, which is John Godolphin Bennett, just listeners so we know yes. we'll talk a bit more about him in a minute so if you'd like to carry on about your suburb yeah. so that was a, a point of contact I knew there was somebody alive in England connected with this mysterious stuff about Gurdjieff and so on and also at the time when I was at university uh, I go into my local bookshop called George's and they had a copy of his book, All and Everything There, oh. which I could read because I there I couldn't afford to buy it, mm. you see. So I did that for a while until a friend of mine gave me a copy for a Christmas room. And it just immediately hit me like a bomb with an immediate connection because you know, different people connect to different things, you know. And they were just like Shazam, you know, but this is the me, you know, I'm in this book, I'm, this is me, this is, I recognize myself in it. Uh, so I had that, and so eventually I went, uh, found out where Bennett was, and he's a place near Kingston upon Thames called Coombe Springs. It was called Coombe Springs because it had a spring house in the gardens which used to feed water to Hampton Court. 
Oh, wow. So it's a Tudor, a beautiful Tudor spring house, you see. Mm. Um, and encountered him, and then I have a story about my first main encounter with him, but this was the connection. Uh, he, just something about his background very, very briefly, he was, um, I see, he was now as a polymath, he knew different languages, he knew mathematics and physics, history, um, he had this passionate interest in Eastern spiritual techniques, and so he's a multi a round up. Uh, <laughs> Renaissance man, you see, so he was very attractive to me. And he, you know, like anybody else, to, or else attempts to survive and make a living and all the rest of you, he was a military intelligence in Turkey, where he came across uh, Gurdjieff. The other time he's going to join with um, Rudolf Steiner, but meeting uh, Gurdjieff uh, affected him so deeply that that changed the course of his life. But then later on he was doing industrial research and during the war, uh, fuel research, which was very, very important for, for the economy and all the rest of it. And after the war, all this place he had with laboratories, um, he acquired because he got out of the business through the device of or making use of the fact one of his people was being accused of being a communist or something, but anyway, he could detect from it and get these premises, and that became uh, Coombe Springs. I don't know when you went to see something, I heard go on talking this story, just in, you would only hear my voice. No, that's fine, you carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, because at Coombe Springs, he started quite a, um, a, like a group, didn't he? But was it a Gurdjieff based group? Oh, yes, group? absolutely, absolutely. No. Again, a slight backtrack to the 1920s, about 1924 or something. He'd been in Turkey at the end of the First World War in about 1919, 1920. And he'd had various experiences because he was um, very good at languages. He was involved in some of the meetings to do with the aftermath of the war, Versailles and so on. And so at first hand he was witnessing the egoism and short-sightedness and pettiness of the people controlling mm. world affairs, and it shocked him to the core. Uh, but just before that, during the war, he had got wounded and had a major thing for him, an out-of-the-body experience, which uh, convinced him of the reality of other worlds. Oh, wow. Okay. So he had those two sides, you see, of uh, you know, his inner experience, but also seeing the world was mad. And, and he met Gurdjieff, and he felt there was somebody who was real about these things and didn't... Um, fantasize or anything like that. And Gurdjieff himself <laughs> says we live in a lunatic asylum, doesn't he? So That's right. So it must have greatly mm -hmm. appealed to Bennett. Yes. Of course, many other people too, like H. G. Wells, he always said the Earth is the lunatic asylum of the solar system, and that kind of thing. So it's a quite widely shared <laughs> uh, belief. And they, he, so Gurdjieff himself, who got out of uh, Russia, He'd entered Russia, actually quite a rich man, a millionaire and so on, married a um, woman from the court of the Tsar and was having various plans to set up his institute to spread his ideas and of course the Bolshevik Revolution blew up. First World War happened, you know, lost all his money. Um, eventually had to escape with his people and it's a tremendous adventure story going down south, a place called Essentuki and then across through Turkey into Germany. He might have settled in England, but the authorities in England were suspicious of him and wouldn't let him have a visa. So he ended up in France and he set up this issue there. So, long story short, and then it, as the Priory was called, he went there for a period of a few months. And I see some, you know, very, very strong, good um, passion between them being the two. Um, but barely with his own career and so on, and, you know, it was, seems absurd looking back and said to Gurdjieff, well, I just, you know, I got to sort out my affairs and earn some money, but I'll be back, and he didn't get back. Yes, because I heard he was only there for one period. Yes, I one thought period. Bennett had been there for quite a few years. But no, no, it's less than a year. Um, but it was very extraordinary because, it's, I don't know why it's extraordinary, well, I think it's extraordinary because he, in a way, was always had this chance to develop his own thing, you know, they always acknowledged Gurdjieff as his 
ultimate authority. But anyway, then he did various things, had various adventures and uh, commercial adventures and disasters and, and all the rest of it. He found Uspensky, the main pupil of Gurdjieff, and became a follower of Uspensky. But when it had that thing with following people, he would do it wholeheartedly, totally. But as he has confessed later on, he could never actually did it totally. He would put all his energies into following somebody and obey them, absolutely. But um, anyway, he got into trouble because during the war, Uspensky went to America and there were people around in London and so on who heard about Gurdjieff and wanted somebody to tell them about his ideas. So Bennett started doing this and then Uspensky turned nasty and said, you shouldn't be doing that, you know, this kind of thing. So well, he didn't like that, did he, Uspensky? Um, he, stopped, he stopped talking to quite a few people about that. I'm trying to remember if it was Walker's book. I've no, it's Walker. Knott's, um, it's one Knott's. of Knott's books I've just finished reading and oh. he was saying the same thing. He'd been part of Uspensky's group mm. And then when he was told he could not speak about Gurdjieff at all or Beelzebub's Towers. Oh, that's I And do, it's quite yeah. sad, yeah, you know, yeah, the yeah. most important parts of the work. And Ospensky said, don't discuss mm -hmm. it. And that's why Not and Ospensky broke up as well, because Not did speak about it. <laughs> and he yeah. got thrown out. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's the background story of, which, I mean, it's just a basic human, social, political story, it always happens that kind of thing. Mm. You get the authorities who are restrictive and there's the renegades and, and all this sort of thing. But the upshot of it was that Bennett has um, got a lot more and more experience of exposition and it became, I believe, one of the best expositors of the ideas. He'd, he'd, for a long time he'd gone on just having the experience of trying to make sense of these things for, for people around him mm. um, and learning as he went, so to speak. And he had, um, I don't know if he'd had at that time early copy of Beelzebub, but he would have heard it in, in Prairie, the first uh, one, which, or some drafts of that, I'm not sure, because the first extant complete one was in 1931, which had been after he left the Prairie. So, then he, in his own work, um, as I said, was looking, what, uh, you know, how do I go on, how do I progress? And he went to America and talked to Madame Uspensky. And Madame Uspensky was quite independent of Mr. Uspensky. Mm. And she's a lovely lady in her own way, and she really was fond of the movements and all that sort of things. And, and Bennett was thinking you know, about how do I get some guidance and all the rest. And she said, why don't you go and talk to Mr. Gurdjieff? He said, what? I thought he was dead. He was <laughs> dead. Oh, perhaps he thought he died during the war or something, especially since he was in That's Paris. Right. Gurdjieff was based in Paris at this time. There you are, and it hadn't got any news. It sounds bizarre now. So, I said, and he found out his address. And it, and it was... Then he said it was crazy. He, this was the flat that Gurdjieff was in was just two blocks away from where he had given a lecture. Oh, oh no! Yeah. <laughs> no idea. You know, <laughs> passing ships in the night. Yeah, yeah, this world is weird. And so they had this reunion. This whole explosion happened then. Um, as they bet it, as you said, in this particular position, just a few months' exposure, not being with him consistently, and sort of then, anyway, coming up and being the equal of Jean de Salzman, who's been with Gurdjieff all the time. Um, and then all these ambiguities and games were being played of who was in charge of what, in what area of the world and so on. But that was um, Mr. Bennett, and I just, so I have to go on talking, but just to say another part of Bennett's work, his own special work, his own special interest, was because he was so, in a sense, widely educated and also scientific, he wanted to make a bridge between modern Western science and Goethe's ideas. Oh, okay. Can you expand a bit on that? Yeah. Well, I think I can do it by referring to his ideas on dimensions, but it's a quite um, approachable sort of idea. See, we live in a world of space and time, and you have people coming around and talking about higher powers or inner realities of a special nature and um, 
communication across time and all kinds of strange things and visitations from higher beings and whatever all that stuff is. And so he thought, well, that's um, not <laughs> very cool is this enlarge our picture of the universe to accommodate this. So, and he added on some dimensions. He got these ideas, these dimensions from a Spensky. A Spensky had a, a six-dimensional view of the world, three of space and three of time. So Bennett got the idea from him, but he developed these and eventually managed to get a, a paper published in the Royal Society you know, on know. five dimensions of geometry. Uh, and point was really that he believed that this could be done and it would help the acceptance of Gurdjieff's ideas. But it, what happened in the fact, of course, his own ideas on the geometry were marginalized because he wasn't really in the swim of mainstream science and there were other avenues being explored. And the, because um, most of the people following Gurdjieff were not interested in mathematical approaches. So, but he always maintained that mm, quest because he thought they should uh, be united, these two streams or whatever it was. And so when I met him, I was very much, um, I felt, you know, sympathique to, um, to this, this kind of union of science and mysticism was um, integral to me. Uh, but as so with Bennett, you had this the logical, empirical side, which you usually do not get in spiritual movements. This is based on belief and authority. But with Bennett, you could argue with him. Hmm. Yeah. He was open to discussion and things. Yes, he was. And he kept on changing his mind. Mm -hmm. You know, for most people, this is a sin. For me, it was the ultimate virtue. If a man cannot change his mind, he's not going on understanding. He's dead. You see. So... And I myself was involved in my own life, my career, and I was studying at Cambridge and how to get a job and I was going to go to Australia to teach science in a university there and then something happened in my family and I swore to my mother I wouldn't leave her, I wouldn't go leave the country. And so I was destitute and ended up at his place near London, Coombe Springs, as kitchen boy. <laughs> I had one pound a week pocket money and I was under the thumb of the dragon <laughs> Lily Herstenius the chief cook <laughs> was there many people living there at that time well there was about 20 odd and of course uh, there was a period of great drama why because for four years Bennett had served the cause of Subud um, then he felt uh, he had to go on or to, to separate from it in some way. So there was this very painful disentangling process. Um, and uh, he was, for a time, living at Coombe Springs almost as um, somebody who lived in the lodge, so to speak, had no power or influence on what was happening whatsoever because it was taken over by this other thing. Because wow. there's always the kind of politics which arises with spiritual movements. Mm. Because we're careful of. Yes. So I turned up there, and he he was just separating, and then we had to reestablish his control of the institute and start new things. But it was what was good for me, or I felt it was a lovely time because he hadn't done the movements, for example, for four years, nor any of the inner exercises, anything of that. So he started afresh. And these are the movements that Gurdjieff used to teach. Yes, that's clear. Because Gurdjieff mm -hmm. believed that movements came along with the reading as well as the intellectual way of mm -hmm. thinking of things. Movements were just mm -hmm. important. They were like sacred dances, weren't sacred they? Sacred dances, you know, with a lot of them with his own special music. Um, but what was delightful for me, you see, uh, I got into this current of learning, of not it all being worked out and handed down. It was being renewed. I remember Bennett had this... Joan, she was uh, his secretary, but she also she was one of these women who was absolutely tremendous at the movements, had this tremendous body memory, and so on. And the two of them would be in front of you, reconstructing these movements, because he hadn't um, not very many elaborate notes at that time, and so on. And that that had all happened 
even in the earlier stages because they were doing the movements with the French groups and then there was a fallout with the French groups so they stopped sending their teachers of the movements to Bennett and so on and so on. But it, I tried to give the impression of the positive impression about all this and then he would run psychological groups and you could go and just observe it. You see, see does this appeal to you? It was all very gentle and um, organic and re-establishing this and he kept, he kept people that could... Uh, also practice the subu thing as an inner exercise called the Latian. Um, because, and he saw that it was, he was almost in this world like a research scientist. He was looking at these different methods, different ways as he came across them and thinking, what is the wholeness? Now the basic argument with people is don't mix things up because you get confused. Okay, and that has a, some validity. But if you want to be whole, you've got to involve the whole of yourself. And usually any one source of methods is a bit one-sided in this. Mm. So he began to feel his way to this all-round approach. And Subud offered a radical alternative to Gurdjieff. Because in the way of Gurdjieff, there is an emphasis on effort. Yes, mm. you have to put the effort in. Yes. No laziness in Gurdjieff. No. <laughs> you have to work hard. Mm. But it had a, an even subtle side to it because Bennett was Mr. Effort. He was ruthless, but particularly with himself. And the story recounted in the diaries, which eventually Elizabeth, his wife, published Idiots in Paris, where she describes Gurdjieff trying to persuade Gurdjieff not, uh, Gurdjieff trying to persuade Bennett not to work so hard. Oh, yeah. Maybe because he was throwing himself in too much. Too he was, much. He, he said, "You said you know, you did." Because Bennett hardly listened to him, <laughs> <laughs> and he had to find out the hard way about this way of just of effort. Um, left out a whole dimension. In a way, it's parallel to there's, a, there's many enigmatic things in Gurdjieff's writings, especially about things like color. And he said there was a positive spectrum and a negative spectrum. What well, people know is a negative spectrum. So there is this positive spectrum. as a sort of metaphor, an analogy, or analogy, because then it saw that he was in the positive, in the negative spectrum, in fact, this effort, there's only one side. And it was like the dark side or the active side, and there was another side which was receptive, the right side. So, and then at the same time, he, as soon as he entered the Catholic Church. And so this up, he kept on upsetting people, you see. Upset the Gurdjieff people by joining Subud. I mean, there are other reasons he upset the Gurdjieff people. I can't name them all, they're innumerable. And then he turns around and joins the Catholic Church, you see. <laughs> and the people are going, I thought this was about being beyond religion, you see, just spiritual. And they said, no, no. And it was extremely important for him, and I appreciate it. And it's in this short talk we can't really go into, but it really, it was for him the connection with the truly supernatural, not the so-called, you know, today there is a lot of vagueness and emotion in it, I mean it's sloppy as hell today, but people, they get any kind of vague feeling, they call it spiritual, mm. you see. They said, no, no, that's, it distinguishing the spirit world and the spiritual world. So, so he was kind of looking for the Christ. Um, yeah feeling of the Christ mm. line. Yes, he certainly, and he took it quite literally in a strong sense, you know, because he had to go through this personal experience about the Eucharist and this was the body of Christ, it wasn't simply a metaphor or anything like this. And how is that possible? It related to his whole background of understanding of dimensions and the nature of existence and all the rest of it, which, you know, that was what he had in him, not other people had, so he couldn't really explain it to them. I felt I'd, I could understand what he was after. But it was the act that you, he was, towards the end of his life, he came towards this, he, he said these things about work on oneself, whatever it is, as struggling with oneself, doing practices. He, he was, in the end, he just said, well, this is, um, mm, this is a bit like marking time. It doesn't. It will never of itself do anything for you. None of that. It says the only thing that works are the supernatural energies. 
Mm. So that was his radical view, you see, which is not the, the general view. Um, do, do you think he was trying to get in touch with supernatural oh, beings? he was in touch with He was, right. <laughs> well, that was it, that was him. He was, um, his change towards the end of his life and uh, under uh, the uh, demanding circumstances. Because uh, there were things to do which I can't say too much about, about what he felt was his own inner task and he was, had this, this thing, there was duty and there was the, his individual task and these are not the same. Um, but that of the supernatural, it was, um, it affects me even now to speak about it, it was just, uh, you, um, so we're not talking playing with magic here then, we're talking no. about he was doing, it would be, be like a meditation type of way of contacting. Not even the meditation, no, no. I mean, right. the meditation is, um, part of the receptive ways and he did actually accommodate to meditation in his later life and particularly through another of his influences this wonderful Cambodian monk Bante. Bante? Uh, yes, it was this short name known, he was known affectionately Bante which means like a monk or something oh. like that you see and he eventually, um, he, he lived to about age of 109 Bante did <laughs> <laughs> and became very popular with a lot of Bennett's people because he was the, a Buddhist and he was um, the seam of compassion, he did healing and and but Ben it you know embraced him, brought him in and said you know, and adopted his um, methods as meditation, but that's meditation, you see, this is not like with Subu for him it was a very serious case, there's this document which is quite intense document about the theology of Subu. What is the source of this action? And he had to really establish it was not the Holy Ghost. Um, but it was what he called eventually the great life force. It was a natural force, not a supernatural force. And then he had to establish why the supernatural force could be connected with the church, which is an existential construct, and all kinds of difficulties he was aware of. But he, in his later talks, indicated this um, this reality, and he could, It was not of the kind who say, "Well, you do this, you get that." Anything like that, you do this, you get that, is not supernatural. Because mm -hmm. all the results would be different every time, kind of well, thing. Well, also they would be dependent, and they can't be dependent on us doing anything. Uh, so, that was his, became his, his story, his, uh, he really went on trying to, um, as a great educator, to make stuff accessible to people, you know. There was another establishment near Sherborne House, where he eventually was, called Bashara, based on the teachings of Ibn Arabi. But he'd go over there and give the most marvellous talks about Sufism, you see, which he wouldn't give to the people in Sherborne. But also the people in Bashara hardly knew anything about what he was saying anyway. But he was, um, he, he was sort of explaining it for them, you know, so he could do that to them. And his multiple interests were religion. He was at one time very interested in the body and he, he knew intimately people connected with Alexander Technique and the Feldenkrais Technique and the Eidolrof. He knew Eidolrof personally and all these body practitioners because the body would be sent and he knew science, he knew history and he kept on doing all of this and he got into eventually to educational research. For the, for the government or just for no, for first of all, it was for a local educational authority in Middlesex at the time, it's different mm -hmm. organized now, to do curriculum reform. And we, we had some young scientists like me getting together, ISERC, we called Integral Science Education Research Group, and we get together and discuss some pattern uh, curriculum, how to teach science and this kind of thing. Uh, and then, soon after that period, as that died away, um, there was Sputnik, which alerted the American authorities, and they got hysterical about education and gave out federal money for 
improving education, which of course the big companies latched onto and stole, like Westinghouse and IBM. And we were involved in some of them because uh, as advisors. Because uh, Ben, it was, you know, just a couple of us had invented um, a new kind of teaching machine and a method of, um, method of understanding. I tell you, he's such a creative guy. Um, so we got involved with all of that and he was, um, and the Institute offered a number of uh, called fellowships and one was my friend Tony Hodgson uh, and then I was then appointed. And it was interesting for me because I was able to follow up a, um, an interest I had in small groups and discussion and dialogue and that was the start of it for me. And, uh, had a chance to go to some technical colleges and do experiments with students and so on. So, just to say that side of it was very, because um, he, Bennett himself, was a kind of very socialist um, and a reformist. As you know, one time in his life he could have become a Labour MP. Um, and typically, because his, he was half aristocrat, his mother was um, from New England and very puritanical. Mm -hmm. um, and I've forgotten the nature of his father. But uh, he want you know, he, we got so used to him um, saving the world and producing great schemes of re reform and so on, and it became a joke amongst us, you know, <laughs> he's got another scheme, you know, sometimes also we'd run away if we saw him coming, you know. <laughs> in case he dragged you in. <laughs> absolutely. But they must have been quite um, enticing in some ways, because he was so enthusiastic and oh, quite absolutely. charismatic, he must have just drew you oh, in. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, that had um. She has this other side to it, like one of the most remarkable colleagues who died last year, Henry Wartop, who became quite renowned for his work on Goethe. Um, he had to just quit from Bennett entirely because he couldn't develop his own understanding, because Bennett was so powerful. You see, charismatic and overwhelming, he couldn't be free enough inside to develop his own thing. And this, see. One of the things that Gurdjieff did, you notice, which may belong to it, and often he, people who were very kind of helpful to him and with him, he would send away. Mm. He'd, yeah, try and stop you being like a follower to You're him, follower. wouldn't he? And it was, in a sense, you could argue this for their own good, and so they can go out and develop themselves. And even, I mean, you see, well, when, like De Harbour and all these few years, the composer who worked with him on the music, just for a few intensive words, and, the, and, Bennett said, and then Gurdjieff says, uh, buzz off. You know, after a very intensive two years, and what did he do? He, um, he uh, got the inner connection, but he went into a lot of film music, which my friend of mine, Gertrude Bloom, is trying to track down now. Um, and he developed his own music, which was quite different than the music he did with Gertrude, so he had his own life. And because De Harman was not as a, a somebody, he was a friend of Kandinsky, you see, completely avant garde, and, and to some extent with Schoenberg. Um, so these people around Goethe were really um, able people. But going back to the educational research, and so we, we did that and we constantly did. So I was brought up in this atmosphere, you see, of discussion, of creativity, of projects. We weren't sitting around looking at our, our navels, you know, we weren't kind of, you know, it was all... It was all investigation and investi questioning. Questioning, yeah, you get very really active. Uh, kind of thing. So for me, afterwards, and I see people who didn't experience that, they just you know, are kind of like treading water, so to speak. You see, you, you, you've got to focus on something. You've got to create something. Otherwise, you, you can't. You talk about understanding the laws of the universe and so on. Unless you, you've got a really challenging task, you never actually concretely discover anything about the laws of the universe, how things really work. Mm. Because you have things, you feel like things are settled, so you're not really investigating it because you've never been taught to move forward mm. anymore, just accept what there is. But the way you was brought up and the way Bennett was, mm. he was, and Gurdjieff, of course, was trying Gurdjieff, to make yeah. us think yeah. and look at ourselves, the world around us, and how to make it hopefully better, a better place. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, one's own individual conscience is very, I mean, Goethe is very clear, and then, like, uh, this looking at the YouTube thing, Krishnamurti is very clear. You know, this tendency to go and help other people is usually idiotism. 
complete self-deceptive um, nonsense. But that's from a lot of religions, isn't it? That we have to be altruistic and help your neighbour and yeah, yeah. when really we should help ourselves first. That's it. Because Goethe's great words for me were to be able. What is it to be able? I mean, for me, this is like the whole teaching. And you mean, do you have enough fuel? Do you have enough guts? Is your nervous system tuned up enough? You know, literally about nervous system. People think about having higher experiences, but they say your nervous system can't take it. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things you do about toughening up your nervous system, so if you have a higher experience, it doesn't knock you unconscious. I and mean, this is literally true, you see. Mm -hmm. um, we would go after these higher experiences and say the last thing you actually want is to have them. You have to be prepared for it, don't you? Both physically, mentally, mm -hmm. and I suppose emotionally would be the other one. Oh, yeah, certainly emotions. Now then, uh, well, that's going on to go to Goethe, but it's very strong, the event we just had, I mean, tried to, with Margit and the other, and Kern, the pianist, we made this total sort of three-brained event, you know, which was almost centered on music and the feelings. You see, and, uh, but this strong, very simple, very strong thing you cannot understand. You have your body, heart, and mind together. And to do this, you know, each of these has got to be awakened in its own special way, because people are not usually awake in their bodies, not awake in their feelings, not awake in their minds at all. You could, well, could you call it spirit, you had to spiritualize them. And then they can, my favorite then they can get together and cooperate and be friends. Before they're just defective mechanisms. And they've got to awaken and then you get this kind of spirit in them. It is a kind of spirit. And so you allow your feelings to feel, your thinkings to think and your body to move. Yeah? But this is a great advance. Because mm. a lot of the time we're thinking when we should be feeling, <laughs> feeling when we should be <laughs> thinking. <laughs> yeah. Each, Oh, you know, go just model there. Each one is trying to do each other's job, you know, and then you throw in the sex center as well, and you've got bedlam. I mean, it's um, it's a mix-up, and so that's got to be settled. Um, it seems a simple thing to uh, let each be of its own nature, and it's been very significant for me because I'm passionately interested in dialogue, and I say it's got you know dialogue is only possible between really independent people. It's not an in-group, everybody agreeing. Well, you know, you've got to be... It's only people who are their own people can naturally talk together. Because yeah. they're not anxious to get an identity, you know, by belonging or joining, and this kind of thing. So that's a lot about all that. Um, and finally, I might say about with my relationship with Ben, it was... Um, uh, you see, you just obviously in some way my dominant mode is that of an intellectual, but then it comes a kind of uh, critical faculty, which I often find very missing in people today. Um, that I adored Bennett, you know, but it doesn't mean I just drifted along with him, you know, and I was sort of separated from him. Um, and he <laughs> that's yeah. nice little song isn't it, from my. My you never phone. There. Neither of us turned our phones off before we started this show. <laughs> oh, <good. It's laughs> We're like, so bad. <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, so he was telling us about your relationship with Bennett. Yeah, and this holding a part of memory. He went uh, broadcasting the note that he had this period when he was at Coon Springs, and then he. Lots of things happened. He was being connected with a man called Idris Shah, who represented an aspect of the Nakshbandi order of those just of, of Sufis. Um, who arrived on the scene claiming his people, whatever sense it was, were the source of Gurdjieff's ideas and he stole them from them and so on. And Gurdjieff had a, I call it a run around from Idris Shah because Bennett would obey, he would follow. You know, he had this. You see, ability. Because uh, did Idris Shah ever actually meet Gurdjieff then? It's something I was never sure of. No, 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 no. So no. he didn't know him? No, no. Not at all, but um, I mean, that's a whole other story, mm, which yes, is an unfilled, mm -hmm. unfulfilled story, of course, you know, how he got here. Also, the fact that his father had been 
in England before him. That's why he, Shah, Shah's mother is a Scottish woman, and so mm -hmm. obviously his father had been in, in, in Britain to do that before, and laid the foundations of various things. But um, then, the, when this whole drama, I mean, Bennett wrote the book, the textbook, to The Dramatic Universe, but he acted it out, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And he met these people, and it was major, like, and so he said, okay, Shaw wants a place, so I'll give him Coombsbrinks. Because his whole estate was given to him. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And then what did... <clears throat> so Shaw was carrying on what Bennett was teaching, or just... Oh, own, no! Put his no. own thing over. <laughs> totally his own thing, you see. So she, I mean, this is act by Bennett was an act of genius, uh, madness, or whatever, because people came and going, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> how can you do this? <clears throat> well, he went through, and it was, a, you know, it's part of, you know, this is a, connected with other traditions, and... See, everything, nothing is like what it seems, you know, and, and there's a lot of strand in Sufism about um, destruction. Though know. so it happened there, we had this incredible jami, this nine-sided building based on the Enneagram, and, you know, and I and some of those just painfully watched it being destroyed. Because um, I was hoping you were talking <coughs> about the, the building, it was um, outside in the gardens, wasn't it? Yes. And you all actually built it from hand together? Like well, a, was, was it a nine-sided room? Oh, was yeah. it? Oh. Before my time, but I did some of it later. If, uh, yes, it was based on... And incidentally about that, um, my... If ever you want to get an impression of the building from inside, uh, my son actually has created a virtual form of it which you can explore inside. Oh, like a 3D program on the web? Oh, okay. Yes. Where would that be found? Well, when, um, I'm finding ways of making it available. This It could still be completed better. But that gives you the the sense of it. I'll briefly describe it. It was, he'd had a, had a group of architects as his students, that he was very impressed by the chapel houses he could attach to cathedrals and so on, which are usually eight-sided, not nine-sided, especially the acoustics and the proportions, and had people look at those. And making a nine, of course, with terrible geometry problems with nine-sided. Uh, but it, it was nine-sided because it was based on the Enneagram, which right. was Gurdjieff's... All, all the angles, all the ratios come from the Enneagram. And it was aligned to point to where Gurdjieff is buried in Fontainebleau in France. For some reason, I don't ever figured out why this upset Madame de Salzman in the French group. I don't know why they were so upset. <laughs> but it's partly because Bennett wanted to open to the world, the mm. people. Because Bennett was so straightforwardly um, honest about things. And there's a story by Idris Shah at, uh, Bennett, when Bennett was buried and so he had a reception or something. And Idris Shah was there. And he was saying, yeah, it was really sad about Benny going. He said he's, he's, um, he's a rare type in this business, he said. He was really innocent. Oh. And it was, he had this kind of naivety in him, which was gorgeous, boyishness, this freshness, you see. Something like Shah was a, a sly old coot, I mean, or younger coot than he was, but he was a sly dog. Mm, but he even of. called it a business. So yeah, yes. he called it a business. <laughs> but that was another side, and I go to another story with. I was lucky one time having odd conversations in person. He said, you know, in the work, you everybody has their own style. And he said, well, Shah's style is to make fun of the work. It's not my style. And so he went on that. But Bennett, that was one of the great teachings I got from Bennett about style. People treat this in general terms. You can't, if it's real, it's not in general terms. It's got to fit your style. And you're going to do it your way and do it my way. And you say, well, this is subjective. No, I don't care. It's what's in you. <laughs> it's in your, you know, that's your way. Because if it's your style, it's going to be true to you. Exactly. That will show in yeah. your presentation. And you've got to make it your own. You see, it's not, as I see at time to time, all these gen general approaches, and then people don't bring, you know, recognize it, and, and all this observing yourself. I mean, the real thing is just getting some concrete sense of what you like. 
And you know, that's got to be brought into the equation. That's what the point of the observation. You can be on a certain point, you know, don't bother about self observation, it's pointless. <laughs> but you've got to get what what do you like? You know, and could and people are constantly denying themselves and not being aware of what they're like and they're because they're pretending to what they suppose is the virtuous ways or the higher states yeah. and they're ruining their lives because of this i get so angry about it because they're d denying they say oh uh, uh, I'm, I'm asleep i'm got negative emotions and i think well, that's what you've got <laughs> so you have to work with them right <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know <laughs> work with what you haven't got <laughs> for god's sake you know, you're going to buy it at the shop <laughs> Terrible. Come and get your negative emotions here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't have jealousy, we yeah. can sell it to you. Because <laughs> yeah. without things, you're not human. <laughs> and, yeah, people have said, you know, those stories are good. You know, people, pigs get into the garden, the prairie, you know, people go, oh, I must not get upset. And Gurdjieff hurtles by, swearing and cursing and driving the pigs <laughs> out, you <Yes>. see. <laughs> what can you do with that anger, with that emotion, you see? And there's this guy, Gurdjieff, like that, and everybody's pussy footing around being. Um, remembering themselves and all the rest of it. So it's using that negative emotion when it's needed in the right way. Like <laughs> it's, it's a deep thing, you know, that's another whole other story about that. Um, there have been a lot of things going wrong in the way the stuff is transmitted as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, so he was well, so much, so many bits and pieces were hardly addressed, but the upshot it as I said, didn't want to go to Sherborne. This, he decided at some point after the Shah thing that he got free of Shah, so really in a sense became his own man for the first time. He was very lacking in self-confidence in many respects, Mr. Bennett. He didn't want to set himself up as a sorry, he always wanted to say, I represent the Gurdjieff, you see, mm. rather than myself. But eventually it was into life, he said, Gurdjieff says this, but I say that, and it's different. You know, not the same. Um, so for whatever, and it's a complicated story, he came to have set up this International Academy for Continuous Education in Gloucestershire, in this place which, you know, like somebody around him just sold their house in Kingston and gave him enough money to pay for it. <laughs> it was all <laughs> hand to mouth, it was just incredible. Uh, and then, but I thought, oh my God, all this stuff going on, I'm fed up with it, you know, because I have my own problems, my own issues, my own whatever. I just. And so it was a very interesting period for me because I went down, I did some you know, stuff with the students there because they invited down people and I actually was doing stuff on theatre. That was my thing at the time, I was into theatre. Um, and um, because the message came through, Mr. Bennett wants you to go to Sherbourne. And I said, no. <laughs> 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 then he did a series of numbers on me in which were led to a very very intimate personal thing with him um, and there's those other sides of things you don't know but it was like I was um, against my will I went to Sherborne and eventually he died of course very inconveniently oh. and he used to say before that you know I'll be more trouble to you when I'm under the salt than I am now <laughs> <laughs> this kind of thing <laughs> and so he went and did that so we landed with it and all sorts of other things happened but it was like I like to tell the stories about him because not uh, in terms of hagiography, you know, praising him or anything. I just, I just obviously, I love the guy, but um, like Virgil, who drove me crazy at times. I really was. Um, you have to get free of them also you know, at the same time, and you know, that's when you get you get you get strong by it um, by breaking free of them. But the end, sort of the end of my story was that as he, his teaching in Sherborne was an, an, a new exploration for him, a whole, whole new ideas. So, you know, it sounds abstract on being and will and the world's um, nature of God and the nature of the work itself. Um, and he did these incredible kind of talks and they were, of course, transcribed. And so when he died, I sort of saw I thought these were so definite, a definite form, that I undertook then to turn them into books, and I did a, about ten books, including the one he was going to write, never got around to writing, based on his talks called Deeper Man, originally to be called Dig a Deeper Man. <laughs> and I Great wish I now had kept the title, and I changed it to Deeper Man instead of Dig Deeper Man, because I thought, ah, 
in the long term that was the better title. Yeah. It's, that turned out to be one of the most reliable and comprehensive books on the psychology of Gurdjieff and as Bennett understood it. So that's that's uh, what I did and the and inherited from him which I've tried to further the best I can through my own uh, sort of non-profit, the diversity, which was really based on the idea of the dramatic university, you know, but it became simply diversity. Uh, these projects, and he had, you know, various fundamental things to do with time, um, but particularly to do with higher intelligence. And, uh, so I eventually wrote this book, which is in there called The Gymnasium of Bliss and Higher Intelligence, which is still my fulfillment of a connection with him and his project on higher intelligence. Cause I'll tell you the policy I make this the final story and the time is running out. The, um, there was one time when it would have been okay, sort of late sixties, let's say somewhere around there. He'd come up with um very inventive you know, kind new kinds of themes and so on to it. The other thing became and I think it was a definite period that came to him because of another backstory I can't go into about this. Uh, we must learn to communicate with higher intelligence. Ta da! Okay. Yes, Mr. Bennett. <laughs> and my story is this I, 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 some of my favourite stories, which is partly against myself, but maybe not. Maybe it's egotistic. I went, you know, had all these groups, had groups in London, groups that went to Coombe Springs. He was sometimes seeing hundreds of people because um, he was so charismatic but there's another story about groups and how they can develop and don't develop anyway I have this group and it's all around the sea and communicating with higher intelligence and it was in London Eden Square somewhere like that and it came out the corridor afterwards and he said to me Tony so what do you think about all of this and I said it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life <laughs> 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 what did he say <laughs> and I said mm, okay and then because he never got it, you know, he never got took it badly. Anything. No. You could say that to him, because, you know, gen but I knew in that moment I was, and I was going to use a, a naughty word, you can't do it on the recording, can you? I was, um, got, because by declaring my rejection, I was compelled thereafter to, uh, do something about it. Mm. It's the, the people who go along with the followers are useless. <laughs> They're no good at all. Honest to God. No? It's the guys who say, this is crap. <laughs> you know, there you've got some potential. And the guys who say, oh yes, it's very interesting. I really like this. You know, Run away. They're not ever going to do anything. It's the old good effing thing. No strong affirmation without strong denial. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got your guts and your passion, as he comes in, now, or resisting, or you, <laughs> you cannot build anything. You know, so I've been very saddened over the years. People, you know, sort of read the nomadic universe and do his exercises, but it's all like following. Uh, so the per people who follow can never become, because they're always downstream. Mm -hmm. They're always looking to be led as well that way. They can't make themselves go forward and do yeah, there in the yeah, next yeah. step. You go against the stream, it's risky. You know, Goethe says this work is against nature, is against God. Mm -hmm. So I used to say to people, this work is against Goethe and against Bennett. <laughs> which is the old thing in Buddhism, if you meet the Buddha on the path, kill him. Don't you know that saying? No, I don't know that that's, saying. Oh, that's a strong saying in Buddhism. Don't get caught by the authority figure. <laughs> oh, but if you... Okay, I have to ponder on that one. You ponder <laughs> on it. It's the game, you know, this is the, for me, the more dynamical world. I mean, if there's somebody who knows the answers, who transmitted these people, and they're going to explain it to the other people. And I think, really? Really? Is it, can it ever be like that? What is this whole thing about waking up and becoming real? Do you think it's according to a manual or a set of rules which you can learn, like yeah. going to school. Like rote. <laughs> like rote, as you say. You know, like two times two is four, or something like this, you know. Conscious labour plus intentional suffering <laughs> equals, you know, development of an inner body and 
all that stuff. And so it's a, a problem, you know. And uh, I was with Bennett, I was grateful for uh, meeting a man who had some science in him. Because I'm very much a Westerner. And I cavail against, you know, these, this usual lament you get to the terrible Western materialistic world. I think this terrible Western materialistic world has some of the highest values ever expressed in human history, including, for example, some care about the role of women, which mm -hmm. you don't find in any other culture mm -hmm. at all. It's very true, yes. And I think, and this is insanity. You know, the more I'm aware of it, the more insane it seems to be. I mean, Gertrude might have been part of it at all. He always played this role of the patriarch, you know. Um, gave no role to women in his writings. You see, he did in, in life in another kind of way, or in perhaps this uh, naughty way. But, um, you mean like there's no women in, for example, Beelzebub's Tale? Exactly. Because in meetings, there's, I forgot well, how to say Vivich her name. Gaya. You know, I love her, but yes. yes, I suppose it's just the one. Just yeah. the one, and there's you know, you know, probably his mother, you know, and then in the third series is... Um, well, his mother and his wife were mentioned, you know, and that's about it. And uh, it's very strange to me that there it is. But also, in the Western world, you get some appreciation of free inquiry or democracy. And again, in no other culture do you get that. And that's why, you know, the fanatics hate us so much, hate it so much, and want to destroy free speech and subdue women, all that kind of thing. So it's very pressure. Here. And also, the West has become the haven for things for Sufis or Tibetan Buddhists, mm -hmm. uh, they're in lands which is not safe for them to be, they can only find their haven in the West. And things of culture, like I have a f dear friend now who does dancing, Travis, and uh, in my last event in Nashville she did some Uzbekistan dances, the full costume. Well, as, as she talked about it, she said, in fact, you can't find this stuff in Uzbekistan itself for two reasons. One has been Sovietized in the past, and the younger generation are not interested. If you want mm -hmm. to find the real stuff, you go to America. But then it's like with Turkey, the dancing dervishes disappeared for many, many decades, mm -hmm. didn't they? But yes, they got banned, and then they, and they came back. But of course that was... But now it's a tourist thing, it's tourist not for, thing, the, for yeah. the people, or for the esoteric teaching that it was originally doing mm -hmm. it, or performing mm -hmm. for. But as you see, that's another interesting story, being mm. in the world but not of it, you know, playing roles and what's visible, what's invisible, you know, all these kinds of things. But let me try and think about Bennett and his... It's very interesting, Bennett, he had, had so much in, uh, influence on individuals. I mean, I don't give much credence to the groups formed in his name. But he's constantly, I'm coming across people who say, oh, I read Bennett because he's... He's straightforward. You know, he's, he really respects the reader, and all these other people are mystifiers. You know. mm. I would uh, agree with that. I, mm. I have a few of his books, mm -hmm. and they've definitely helped me with my understanding of yeah. Gurdjieff. He lays it out for you. He's not kind of like trying to persuade you. And the way he talked, you know, he actually discussed it once with me. It was very interesting. He was a very, very extraordinary public speaker, extremely articulate, but in two senses. And one was he could be heard. And, but he took lessons for that, elocution and projection lessons from the voice trainer. But also he could speak st in structure. He, he's the only person I know who actually speaks in sentences. And so the transcriptions are easy from, from his talks. And he would, um, so he would, he, you know, he feel he's devoting himself to the audience, instead of projecting himself. And he said he doesn't, put affect in his voice. You maybe heard talks I've heard on a couple of his talks. You see online. there's no kind of emotion in his voice, so to speak. It's not dry, hmm. it's not dull, but it's some of there's not this emotionality, there's no wish to persuade anybody in his voice. He just lays it out for you. And so it's very um how to say clean cleansing in a way. It's very clean what he's doing. He's not like leading by the nose <laughs> and using rhetoric. He doesn't use rhetoric at all, hmm. hardly it just comes from the impeccability of, of his presentation and of course enormous practice lectures after lectures you know weekend after weekend lunchtime talk lunchtime talk on and on and on and on this kind of thing uh, 
So he wasn't a man, you know, like sometimes you get people like this that just love their voice. He actually oh. wanted to pass on information. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. You know, absolutely. Um, he does it. He, he often did it so well that people would just hear and think, oh, now I completely get that. Then they go in and think, well, what is it I've got? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. You <laughs> <laughs> come around and you work it out. You, but he did so much work. So he was genuinely interested in education um, and the in nature of the mind and learning and all that kind of thing. But that's, um, see, a research I do is these days very disappointed in what's labelled under the fourth way. There's hardly also anybody doing any research in it. It's all as if, as if they got the legacy and they're just flogging the bits and pieces of the legacy. Well, they ought to be doing something with all of this, with Benny Uro's doing something, you know, creating something, a method, and he developed, you know, all these... And taking it further. Taking it further. Mm. I mean, I use it or lose it. Mm -hmm. And also, I feel very strongly, people pick up on top of these ideas, don't do anything with them. Um, and it rots in them. But he says a poison, it poisons the mind. If you do have something, you can't use it. It just sits there. In my opinion, it decays and poisons your system, your man, it decreases your mentation. You know, you've got to be able to chew hmm. on this stuff. Yeah. Because yeah, I see what you're saying, yeah, it's just becomes stagnant within you, you've oh, got to keep it going around. Keep like, it going around I think Gurdjieff some, said something like that about laughter, didn't he? You've got to laugh or it will it'll turn to poison inside you. Well, that's, uh, well, it's partly that it was just the laughter as a release of yes and no together, so, which, as you say, it will discharges that. Um, but it must mm. be the same with what you're sort of saying of, if you don't do it, like you're mm. saying, if you don't mm. do it, you lose it, yeah, instead it stagnates yeah. and it will poison you mm. instead of moving on with it, or maybe you become too fixed in your views or something, or, you know, what you've been taught. So you need to progress with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And f it all gets flattened out, you know. When dealing with a lot of people, um, they come with questions like, what, what is this? And they've got some words from Bennett or Goethe or whatever, and often just don't reply because it's useless. I know from the start. Because to ask a question, you see, everybody thinks they have a right to ask a question. And for them means nothing more than putting a few words together with a question mark on the end. Um, but they haven't done anything in asking the question. Gurdjieff had this phrase, the burning question. I mean, something which really is a fire in your heart about this, you know, matters to you, like life or death. You know, I uh, think so perhaps you don't have to be quite so dramatic. You've got to, you see, if you ask a real question, it's all, it's, um, it's like your own act, even in the very simple scale, your own act of humbleness in front of the unknown and you've got to have this genuineness that I don't know and I ask you you see and not that the most people ask questions and they've really got all sorts of ideas and beliefs and they want to get from you something which conforms to what they already have and that's disaster mm -hmm. you never learn anything from anybody from that so this it's really is an opening asking a question is an opening you know of, your, of yourself and it's it's an incredible and in itself um Discipline and risky and all the rest of it. Um, so now these, when <laughs> Spensky in his lectures on London, you know, he give these lectures and very formalized questions and answers afterwards. And the difficult thing would be, so we come with the question, um, how do I do self remembering or whatever? And the Spensky would simply say, formatory next, formatory referring to formatory apparatus, mm -hmm. a filing clerk, which doesn't doesn't think at all. He just slots bits of information into different files. There's no thinking. So imagine if people were sat through it and no day they wouldn't do it nowadays. Everybody come up with these questions, formatory, next. <laughs> until some, more explanation. <laughs> until somebody gets there and you get you know, I've been on you know side of the test of it, somebody you even if they're kind of hardly can put the words together, you know, something genuine there is worth dwelling in. But most people are just wanting confirmation of their beliefs and prejudices, and so... And then they right. can carry on as they are. As they are. So when I don't answer them, suddenly, of course, they get very cross with me. 
That's it. It's not worth it. Which is also saying like they're not worth it, which is an unpleasant thing to say. Um, you've got to always say it all it's a kind of game or something, you've got to but you've got to there's a sort of membership fee, you've got to pay something. You gotta sacrifice something to be part of this game. You know, to be part of it and it's part of it. And it's just totally extraordinary. It's it's, it's this is why I feel frustrated in the people taking a narrow way. I was thinking today about Gurdjieff and saying, who the... <laughs> don't care about Gurdjieff, even shit on Gurdjieff. It's um, all these people, of course he's been a contributor, but what's really going on? You know, doesn't have to be put under Gurdjieff's hat or Krishnamurti's hat or Shriner's hat or whatever hat it is. You know, because the thing to do is awaken to the reality of the world of death, of us as human beings, and that's the thing. Is if Gurdjieff helps, fine. It doesn't help. Leave it. Leave it. Yeah. Go off. Use it. Leave it. Apply yourself. Find out for yourself. I mean, this terrible world we're living in, you know, and all these enigmas you know, sick inside us, all the inheritance of our problems of our families. Um, <sighs> tiny little lifespan. Which we've got to develop ourselves into <laughs> become that acorn that grows into the <laughs> oak tree. <laughs> Yeah, get a seed, yeah, something to grow inside us, that to get cooked, and all those sorts of things. Uh, well, I find sometimes with Gurdjieff, for people that haven't studied other forms first, maybe whether it's Steiner or Blavatsky or whoever, I think he's he might not be the first thing to always go to. Like I think you, you picked him up when you was young, but you had an inkling, you had that... Uh, need for something already mm -hmm. where sometimes for some people I think they need to study all the others so that they can see that wonder, Gurdjieff you know. covers all everything where <laughs> a lot of them only cover one thing <laughs> or one aspect of everything where Gurdjieff seems to do a whole of mm. everything in his work. It reminds me of that phrase I was, I was, I was, I was sort of used it about myself in different contexts like, a musician's musician because mm. uh, it's probably um, uh, Gurdjieff is not no, we will be in, at all popular. Because the musician position is somebody who speaks to musicians, you see, but um, not to the general public. Mm. Uh, and like, you know, this, uh, the for, this is going on the side issue for, uh, you know, Wim van Dulleman, who is so important in the performance of the movements and the music. And his three first teachers were, were jazz musicians, you know. I didn't music. know that. Oh, oh yeah. He said one of them was absolutely amazing, but he, to earn a living, had to be a car park attendant. He couldn't get gigs. Because the general public couldn't get what he was doing. But the musicians loved him. <laughs> because they understood or saw that mm -hmm. he was the yeah. next stage on in music. music. Mm. Musicians, musicians. You see, I think Gurdjieff is a bit like this. It's all about, you know, Gurdjieff is about know how, you know, how to make things work. and. Ben has written about it. He said it's not, you know, people are on the ideas and beliefs and why. He said it, it, it doesn't really matter. It's all about um, how to do things. Mm -hmm. Tony, I wanted to ask you did you ever hear Bennett himself read Beelzebub's Towers? Because he did used to do big sessions, apparently, days on end of reading it <laughs> out loud, obviously. Yes, I was there out loud and uh, I, was, I was never there for his marathons, which was four hours on and four hours off. I mean, it typifies his um, extreme effort, you know, if he said his tongue was swollen and all the rest of it. But no, I did hear, constantly heard him, so of course I had a wonderful education in how to pronounce some of these weird words of Gurdjieff. And eventually then, at Sherborne, he died, I took on the readings of Beelzebub, so I had some practice. And this surface many years later when a friend of mine in the States said, why don't you record Beelzebub's tales? And I first said, no, why should I? And I started doing it. And this was a whole revelation for me about this. And so I have, as briefly, I have uh, recorded all of Gurdjieff's writings, extant writings, and also other books like In Search of the Miraculous, Mount Analog by René Delmao, and other books of uh, mystics and, and the rest of it. But it, uh, Again, it was uh, uh, um, a thread of connection with Bennett to take on these readings 
and it taught me something and it taught me something about the interpretation I'm sorry I'm going on a bit about this so interesting to me this is a bee in my bonnet you see people who read things like Bells of Hotels and they well, read Bells and they try to find they have lectures as you know and conferences about what it means um, but I've got myself by and large more and more disillusioned about explanations of any kind whatsoever and I suddenly thought well something came through these, doing these readings I remember the first time I did it was actually in Microsoft Studios in Seattle in quite some time ago, it was 11 o'clock at night, just chapter one of Beelzebub. The arousing of thought. <laughs> arousing of thought was so momentous, you see. And I said, anyway, I was absolutely, literally, I was literally between the lines was a musical score, a score to do with emphasis and nuance and so on. And that I was reading from this score. Um, and that affected me. I thought, that is the interpretation. So I don't, wait, I want to top, stop ever, ever again. I don't stick to this ever again explaining anything in Bells or just read it and in the way it's read is my best meaning of it you mm. see so th thank you for talking about all of those and I talked about the projects and the projects with Bennett with communicating with higher intelligence and mentioned that book um, Gymnasium of Police and Higher Intelligence which I, I'm really proud of it may seem just plain arrogance to say this but it took me a long time to go through the question and face the question myself. How on earth would I justify writing about higher intelligence? Yeah. I mean, we've got books around people deeply talk about what God says or the, what this is or this reality, right? I can't do this. I'm just a human, not a human being, wondering, you know, speculating. So I had to find the way to do it which could be really authentic with no claim to superior knowledge. I now, I loathe and detest and hate anybody who claims superior knowledge. <laughs> I know what you mean, because uh, where did they get it from? What, you know, what, I know what you mm, mean. <laughs> they're using it to assume power over others. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, this is wrong, 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 <laughs> you know. And so, but, but then you see, if you don't assume superior knowledge, how can you say anything? So I just say, well, I'm having a discourse about how how people talk about this, which is all I've done. Mm. And so, it's, and uh, even in my previous book about the Enneagram, you know, there's been people have latched onto this, produced this system of personalities, and they claim it's some ancient original teaching or something like this. But you get this claim, ancient special teaching which they've happened to uncover, you see, um, inventing it. And all sorts of claims have been made for it. It was Christian, it's Sufi, it's Rosicrucian, um, whatever. Um, many people are so eager to claim they know the source of it and are in contact with it. And in my book, I say none of that. I said, I've read these books and I've thought, this is what I know and can do. And this, and I share this with you. But this one, Gurdjieff himself was so guilty of all this. He used the two main marketing methods with its um, A, it's ancient, B, it's Eastern. And he exploited these to the hilt. But it's a marketing ploy, you see. You've got to break through all of that, you know. Is this ancient wisdom? Hmm. Yeah. It is a kind of ancient wisdom and it's something that's been taught, not the Enneagram itself, but the basics of know thyself and you know, attain to be a higher person has been mm. in the philosophies and the yes, that's so true. various religions yeah. for that I mean, ever. There's an open but question. I mean, there's, uh, we know Bennett, right to him, he was always trying to do his best to find a literal meaning in what Gurdjieff claimed. And, he was fascinated by this idea of the Samun Monastery and the Samun Brotherhood and it did the research it <coughs> led eventually to that book, The Masters of Wisdom, um, which was partly written and that's another story. He didn't get to write the bits about the modern age in the West, which would have been the most interesting ones. But uh, <coughs> Is that because he, 
he passed away before he, he died, finished yes. it. Right. He, he oh. sketched them out and we thought, this would have been interesting if he'd lived to do it. That would have been more serious. <laughs> as he's older it is and the further away it is, the more you can waffle. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's somebody to know, he's like, you see, meetings in a remarkable... I'm going off terribly. I'm so excited about all this. See. The meetings in a remarkable man, <coughs> men, and I said, well, they laid it out, these are really special characters. And he defines it in a very high sense. But, come on, it's, um, it's got to be you and me. I mean, you put it in a book, but it's... it's as uh, Joseph Aziz says, that meeting of remarkable men is auto-mythology, it's not autobiography. Hardly any of it is factually true. Mm -hmm. um, so these, because some people say these characters are all different aspects of Gurdjieff. For example. What he yeah. wanted to be or what exactly. he was trying to be. Yeah, that's the thing. And so there you are, you see. But the meeting of remarkable men, uh, for me, the core of it, he doesn't explicitly address it, but he demonstrates it in time. These characters, whatever they were, did something, they were remarkable, I say, not so much in what they were, but remarkable because they could work together. They were very different and they can work together. For me, that's remarkable, that's what you rarely see in the world. You know, people could really work together, this world would be transformed. You know, you know, people go on and on about egoism and being free and open-minded all these generalities in you, but just working with your neighbour is for me the, the big thing. Brings the neighbours together will make the world a better place. Oh, well, you do... <coughs> working together is not straightforward. And people who... Often enough you get people advocating cooperation, working together, and they mean in their way. They don't really allow for difference and I think the great people in the world now are, and they may be dealing with things in politics or religion, whatever, uh, some are finding the enablement of people of different minds to work together, and that's the, the true work of the Holy Ghost, I would call it, you know, from the Pentecost, and it came to give the gift of tongues, you see, this is to find the real common speech between people. As people want to jump in to say, oh, let's agree, We've all got different views, so how no. can we all agree? No, how, yes, and you can't just... What are all... You've got to do something, do you, in <laughs> order to get to the point of being able to agree. And um, part of it is entails actually looking at the, at the disagreement and accepting it, because I've worked in dialogue for quite some time, and I see this as people say, yeah, of course I know we have different minds, but they don't know it. It takes something to really know it, and I've seen people in whose sort of eyes go wide open, and they say, you think differently from me, and they're totally astonished. But they would have said before, of course I know you think differently from me. I am, and I'm open-minded to all these differences, but when it hits you, it's so different. Perhaps I'll try and make it the final word, we've called this pronouncing. My favourite lectures of Gurdjieff, actually, not that, was um, one he called connaissance, which means knowledge or knowing. And he said, what is the object of all this, and da da da, he says, to know. And it's interesting with this. He said many things, of course, and mostly about being, but to know. And I think about that as if to truly know anything is extraordinary. It's all this pseudo knowledge which gets in the way. And you know, there's a going along which gets in the way. To really know something is extraordinary. You know, it's that come, every, the whole universe becomes alive. You know, and if you. It's the story of good if you say, if a man can make shoes, you can talk to him. <laughs> but he can't talk to an arsehole. <laughs> no. They don't know nothing. Mm. Not nothing. But he's, he's known. Because why? Because he knows it with his body, his heart, his mind. He, he knows. Well, thank you, Tony. It's been a, a riveting talk. I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, just one thing. Where, if anyone was interested in your books or your talks... What's your website? I can, you see, all you need to know is remember my name, Anthony Blake. So it's www.anthonyblake, then you get the .co.uk. So I think it's that's anthonyblake.co.uk. With the H in Anthony Blake. Okay, then, well, I'll also um, 
write that up on the okay. uh, web bit. Mm. Same. I have are. a major sort of set of archives and stuff in my other website from my non-profit the university, which you get under. <coughs> excuse me. D u v e r s i t y duversity dot org, and they've got a tremendous load of archives on, including um, <coughs> I'm putting oh, stuff projects. in one place about um, you know the the comic book version of the the inner work and the Gurdjieff Action Man and this kind mm -hmm. of thing. You can one of my up. favorites is the Gurdjieff Action Man. You are better <laughs> yeah. with the <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Tony. Oh, thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Pleasure. Bye.